Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 Podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find their written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it really, really helps us out. It does a huge amount of exposure to the show. I know I say it every week, but it does not become less important on a weekly basis. And if you've taken that five seconds to give us five stars, it really does mean a lot and you are an absolute legend to us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson and joining me for a special Players 2 podcast out of time, but we have quite a fun game and I'm quite looking forward to it. Is Mr. Lewis Campbell. It is indeed. Hello, Mark. Yes, we are recording a very special episode this week because we are both technically on holiday as you listen to this. So we have recorded out of time and we are coming to you with a whole new idea. Full disclosure, we are recording this directly after <laughs> the last podcast that you listened to. And I'm losing my voice a little bit yeah. already. And we are <laughs> two minutes into the recording. So strap in. But yes, we have decided this week that we're going to do prob- what is probably the first of a two part thing that will just second part will happen at some random point in the future. But we're going to do our Desert Island Games, Mark. Desert Island Games list. Now... Desert Island Discs, of course, a great British classic. Yeah, an institution. I think. An institution, absolutely. I am, of course, familiar with the concept of Desert Island Discs, having never actually listened to Desert <laughs> Island Discs. But I think a lot of our listeners will probably be in the same boat. Yes, uh, that's very likely. So Desert Island Discs is, for those of you who do know, is a, an enormous institution of British radio broadcasting and... The, the simple premise of that being you interview people from all walks of life and you ask them essentially for the eight records that they would take were they to be sent to a desert island. So we are going to do almost the same game effectively, but we're going to talk about our desert island video games. So these are the eight games that Mark would take were he to finally be locked up and sent to a fucking desert <laughs> island. <laughs> but I should also point out a few rules and a little bit of context about the, the concept, which is that it's not just Mark's top eight games, because that's very likely going to be a couple of games that we talk about all the goddamn time on this show. So the, the idea behind this, not to say that a lot of those games won't come up here, but the idea being that it's a bit more of a reflection on your life as a gamer, the types of games that you've loved to play, games that mean something to you, and also what games would actually be useful to have on a desert island. So a one-hour narrative game or a stupid mini-clip thing that you liked when you were 12 might not be the right answer for some of this. But yeah, it's not necessarily just going to be the games that we talk about at length because they're the recent games. It's games that would be suited to being on a desert island. Exactly, basically. exactly. And so, and a couple of other stipulations. We're saying that we've got a fantasy console on the island that can play anything, any generation and any console or any PC game, no matter what specs, this this machine can play everything. So don't worry about what it was originally on or anything like that. We're also saying that you can have online multiplayer games And those multiplayer games would have fantasy servers. So again, you don't have to worry about a game that you loved that was on the PS3, say, but that obviously no longer has support, even (laughs) never mind an actual lobby of, of players. But crucially, because you are on a desert island, only one of those games will you be enabled any kind of communication, any sort of voice chat or in-game chat with your friends, because, you know, you are supposed to be remote. That's the whole That's the whole point. <laughs> the whole yes, I do understand that yes. portion. But first of all, because this is what would happen on the real show, just give us a little bit of a flavour of you as a gamer, your life in games, so to speak. What do you play? I mean, if, you, if you're a regular listener, you're going to know a lot of this stuff. It just for anyone who's coming to this fresh, tell us about Mark Henderson, video gamer. Mark Henderson, video gamer. Wow. Well, Well, I first started playing games, I suppose, on other people's consoles because I didn't have any and it was my cousin's consoles, two separate cousins. One of them had a Sega Mega Drive and one of them had an SNES and I remember playing Donkey Kong Country very distinctly on that SNES and an alien game that I was definitely, (laughs) definitely too young to play on the Sega Mega Drive and as well the Aladdin game yeah the Disney's Aladdin game on the Sega was absolutely incredible absolutely amazing so that's kind of where I started my first proper console that I owned was a PlayStation was a PlayStation 1 which you got at the same time yeah and basically from there I have followed the PlayStation lineage 
and a lot of my gaming experiences really have been tied to gaming with you mm-hmm. uh, like, in all honesty and that is really why we started this <laughs> podcast is because we have a huge gaming history together and it goes all the way back to when we were literal children yeah yeah, that's that's where I came from. I mean, I like to play a lot of different types of games. I mean, I very highly value narrative in games. I like adventure games a lot of the time. I do dabble quite a lot in the FPS genre, particularly if we're playing online. That would be my general go-to. But beyond that, I don't get tied down to any specific genre, to no. be honest with you. I float about. I love a good fighting game. I love a good racing game. love a good RPG. love a good JRPG. doesn't really matter, I, as long as it's good. As long as you have something there to grasp onto, you know? Mm-hmm. So you've had all the PlayStation consoles. I know that you've already got the Xbox One X, but that's not your first Xbox, am I right in saying? That is not. I also had a 360, which I also bought at the end of that generation, (laughs) to play Borderlands 2 on. (laughs) Yeah, that never really got much use. I'm kind of hoping that my One X will get a lot more use. And obviously I've got a Nintendo Switch as well, which is my first Nintendo console. But I had played quite a few of their games emulating but you shouldn't do that because it's illegal but i did do that (laughs) um you also had uh, some nintendo handhelds as well right over the years and i had a game boy yes back in the day i had a game boy advanced as well i never had a ds up until recently actually i only bought a ds maybe in the last three years and it was to play fire emblem awakening which was awesome and totally worth it so yeah maybe i should get more into old ds games i've always wanted to own a a vita to play the old persona games as well but now that's coming to pc so it's a wee bit like ah is it worth it (laughs) probably not (laughs) Well, I think that's a, that's a good overview of you as a gamer. We can start to see what eras and what sort of influences might be present there. But okay, here we are. We're putting you onto the boat. We're sending you off to fantasy Caribbean islands. Why not the Caribbean? I don't know where the desert island is actually yeah. supposed to be, but we'll call it could it be in worse places. It let's say it's the Caribbean. Places, yeah. yeah. I mean, God, let's not say the North Sea. I'm let's not, go to yeah, the Caribbean. I'm not giving you a climate <laughs> worse than this one. So. Um, but you are going to be staying in all day playing video games. So, Mark, tell us your first desert island video game. Well, I think I want to kick things off with the multiplayer game because there will only be one. Okay, cool. And now that I know that we're on fantasy servers, which is excellent, it will be Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, which is probably the best multiplayer game that I have enjoyed anyway. I Call of Duty these days is kind of shit on quite a lot, but then at that moment, if you were a gamer then when online gaming was really taken off in a big way, particularly in the console space, Call of Duty was just head and shoulders above the rest, unless you were on Xbox and playing Halo, but I wasn't. <laughs> so Call of Duty really was there on Battlefield as well, I suppose was the other one at the time. And I got so into it. Like, I got really, really good at Modern Warfare 2, specifically Modern Warfare before it, the Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, and then Modern Warfare 2 came out, and then that really was so much fun for me. I probably played Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 more than I've played any other game ever. Wow, wow, wow. I loved it. Like, I can still remember we tricks and places to go and maps and the best place to go. And I even remember what my loadout was for the, the guns and the, the perks that you had at the time. This is way before the times that things like this were ruined with grinding mechanics and microtransactions. <laughs> Although there was a fair amount of grind, to be fair. But yeah, I mean, honestly, that is the most fun that I have had playing a game online ever. And I'm not a big online player, to no, be honest. No, no. You know this. Other contenders for this were actually Warzone and Apex Legends, both of which have came out relatively recently, which are probably the games that I have enjoyed playing online the most recently. Yep, yep, yep. But ever. And if I can have fantasy servers on my fantasy console on my fantasy island, then absolutely, yeah, it's going to be Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, I think. So yeah, you're definitely looking basically to replicate this 2009 experience of video gaming that you had yeah so this was a time where i was at uni and gaming at this particular moment was probably the darkest that has ever been for me because it was all about going to uni and studying or going out and drinking that was my life at that particular moment it was very much the student life yeah <laughs> and gaming at least you were doing really the studying have, part <laughs> well Sometimes. probably not as much as i should have been to be honest but the gaming that i did at this time was largely just go home play a few hours of modern Modern Warfare and then go to bed. Mm-hmm. That was that was my gaming at that time. I w- wasn't playing a lot of other games. For example, the Uncharted series, which was dominant yeah. at this time, I didn't play at all because I didn't have time for it. I didn't value it at that particular moment in my life. What I did value was coming home, playing a couple of death matches in Call of Duty, and then going to bed with friends. Was that were you always on voice chat or? 
Uh, actually, I played by myself probably more than I played with friends, yeah. weirdly. Probably as it drove a lot of people online. But yeah, I played, I went into lobbies by myself like quite a lot. Not <laughs> adversely playing with friends. Like if I could play with friends, I would play with friends. But it wasn't about going on to play with friends. It was about going on and it was just that release in the day. I suppose, yeah, yeah, it? yeah. Nice. Okay, so uh, what about game number two? Well, game number two and game number three are going to come together. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And they are going to be Tekken 3 and Burnout 3. Oof. Which are two games that I enjoyed immensely beating a certain Lewis Camley <laughs> Which were absolutely sensational games in our childhood. Yeah. Really, I mean, really solidified our competitiveness with one another, <laughs> I would say, in playing video games. And for me, Tekken 3 was such a momentous game at the time. Of course, fighting games have got much more sophisticated than Tekken 3 was. But to me, I'll always remember Tekken 3. I'll always remember the moves. I'll always remember the timing, which was so slow going back and playing it now. <laughs> Particularly the PAL version, which was um, a 50 50 hertz rather than 60 hertz which a lot of international people would have been used to but it was just great like i just love it and anytime that i do go back and play it and i still have the disc and i still have an old ps2 that it works yeah, yeah, yeah. i still love it i still love it every single time with the blocky polygon graphics and everything it is just fantastic i i, I love the game i don't know what else to say it's one of my favorite games ever and is one that i enjoyed playing you at quite a lot yeah and losing frequently at um, and winning <laughs> more frequently so is it fair to say Tekken three is your favorite Tekken game as well Tekken 3 is my favorite fighting game you're right and wow. okay. it's one of my favorite games ever it's beyond the reach I suppose of a lot of other fighting games no matter how good they are mm-hmm. it, it's one of these games that just holds a special place in your heart and the same with Burnout 3 I mean arguably the Burnouts that came after it Paradise specifically are better than Burnout 3 but it doesn't matter yeah. because Burnout 3 is the one that brings a smile to my face even thinking about playing it <laughs> and we went back and played it not really not that long ago because again I have a copy of it sitting right here and even going back and the graphics weren't that great and some of the mechanics weren't as good as they probably could have been but the sensation of speed in this game is unbelievable even today even today racing games do not match the sensation of speed that burnout gave you and that is beautifully arcadey style and i just love it i just loved it at the time so i just remember playing it for the first time and thinking this is ridiculous that i am able to go this fast and control the car Mm -hmm. somehow (laughs) it was just fantastic i I love that game so much as well and again it brings back a lot of nostalgia about sitting in my parents house playing it with you absolutely on on my big gaming chairs or around at yours where you were pretending to beat me at tekken you know what i mean it was (laughs) was just very reminiscent of our childhoods genuinely and like i have a very very strong connection with those two games specifically about that you know yeah absolutely and it's interesting those are games from i mean they couldn't be too far apart in years but different generations but tekken 3 was a ps1 game burnout 3 was a ps2 game and i and i know exactly where you're coming from particularly around burnout that i remember you sinking so many hours into paradise and talking about paradise quite a lot and getting excited when the remaster was coming out in the last year or two whenever that dropped yeah but takedown itself burnout 3 was just this amazing moment where this new thing was happening and you're totally right about the speed like compare that to games like gran turismo that we'd been playing before that or whatever there's yeah. just no comparison a, to- a totally different thing though i mean it's obviously going yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, a, the very racing sim type of thing but i also like considered putting gran turismo 3 on this list oh, wow, wow, wow. because actually it is weirdly the only game i think me and my dad have ever played together oh, wow, and nice. that was almost the making it onto this list but i really couldn't just justify not putting burnout on it <laughs> so here we are and with tekken as well so th- so th- those two games are kind of linked in my mind quite strongly and for a long long time they were in fact they still are i don't know why i'm saying for a long, long time those two games are easily two of my favorite games ever nice so two sort of heavily personally nostalgic multiplayer games there at least couch co-op games god please bring them back what is <laughs> your what's your fourth game going to be well Lewis, i think that this one is going to be You've got a lot of time in your hands, don't you? You've got a lot of time in your hands on the desert island. So what better genre of game to bring along than a massively long JRPG? (laughs) And it would have to be, it would have to be the original Final Fantasy VII. The original. So you're the original Final Fantasy VII. With all its blocky little weird looking men in it. All of that. (laughs) All its badly translated dialogue. All of that beautifulness would come with me 100%. Yeah. Superb. So, okay. First of all, why Final Fantasy VII? It's my favourite JRPG. It's the reason, along with another game that we might come across, that I love JRPGs. 
I love menu driven combat, which sounds so bizarre to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> but it's just something you're used to. It's like a totally different skill from action combat. It's, it's much more strategically focused. And I really like that about games. I could do with a lot less random encounters in that specific game. But overall, I, I love it. I love it so much. Again, I have so much nostalgia for it. And again, there is that kind of loose tie to my dad because he actually brought me a copy of Final Fantasy VII that he found <laughs> that only had one disc in it. That I still have. I actually still have this yeah, copy of the game. And I had to buy another copy of the game with the first disc and the other two to complete it because I finished the first disc about three times and oh, never wow. actually got I don't think I knew that story. <laughs> no. I, as it turns out, about half the game is on the first disc mm. anyway. So you're getting a lot of playtime out of that first disc, you know. But yeah, that, so that is a sort of weird tie to my dad. But also of how I think about myself as a gamer moving forward and that I... I probably wouldn't be as interested in anime as I am, Mm -hmm. but without games like this, I wouldn't be as interested in other sort of very culturally Japanese games, I would say, without Final Fantasy VII. It was probably a big part of why I was interested in a lot of those types of games, like thinking of other favourite games that have come along over the years, like Nier Automata and things like that. Do you know what I mean? Even respecting more, I suppose, what Hideo Kojima was doing in his day and suddenly realising that the Japanese were doing all these weird and wonderful things in video games. Do you know what I mean? I think that Final Fantasy VII, in a lot of ways, was a gateway to really understanding that and yeah. the really fact that they were doing something totally different. Because before then, the only real appreciation I probably had for a Japanese designer was probably Kojima. And even that was a very Western-feeling game. Oh, yeah, do you know absolutely. what I mean? By, by design, by yeah, his yeah, design. Exactly, yeah. But whereas Final Fantasy VII is unapologetically Japanese. Yeah, totally. I mean, and it's so ingrained in that style of Japanese. Japanese video game development for one particularly RPG development I mean it's so to me at least and I'm much more separate from that world than you are but it's Final Fantasy as a series and 7 in particular maybe is part of the fabric of what Japanese video game development is and was it changed a lot with that and yeah. it certainly was a breakthrough in the west mm-hmm. oh yeah, I mean? yeah in yeah, a yeah. big big way you know when did you first play that then I played it a lot later than it came out yeah. I actually played it on the PS2 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was obviously a PlayStation 1 game yeah. but I played it a long long time I couldn't say specifically yeah, but, but I played it a long time after it originally came out yeah, yeah nice and so I guess the bigger question here is why not the remake? You could take one or the other game, but you've gone for the original. Is that just nostalgia speaking? Do it's you- not the same, man. Yeah. No? It's yeah. not the same. And it's longer as well. This is... Uh, of course, yeah. You're getting the... Desert Island thing, game. Yeah. I'm getting the whole game with it. All three discs yeah. in my fantasy console at once. Don't need to change them or anything. Amazing. And yeah, it, it's just... It's just for me an important game, do you know what I mean? It's a game that I look back on and think, oh, that was a moment where I changed how I thought about video games because of that game. Great. So a seriously important game for you there in Final Definitely, Fantasy yeah. Seven. What's coming up next? What's your fifth game that you're taking to the Desert Island? Well, I would say that the next game is probably the gateway to Final Fantasy Seven. Okay, okay. And that is Pokemon. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this would have been easily the first menu-driven game I would ever have played. Mm-hmm. This would have been the first JRPG I would ever have played. And I think I would take Pokemon Gold rather than Red and Blue just because there's kind of more, to be honest. I mean, these games are so incredibly linked in my mind. Like, Red and Blue and Gold and Silver are just a marriage of the same thing in my mind. Do you Mm. know what I mean? Because I was so young when I played them. And to be honest with you, having gone back and played them multiple times over the years like i obviously i can distinguish quite clearly what what one is what but back then i i was thinking oh no this was in this game and this was in that game like they were so intertwined in my mind but i think i would choose gold gold was the one i had over silver not that i have any particularly strong feelings towards gold or silver i know people get a bit tribal about that and there's just (laughs) no need for it but i would probably pick gold and yeah again i think that pokemon it was probably the first time that i really sort of identified as being a gamer right well you know what i mean because then it w- was such a big deal and it just took over our, our schools at that time. It was just such a hugely popular thing. And this was when the anime was coming out and all that as well. Yeah. And it just took over the world at that moment. And it was just so instrumental on me and loving games. And do you know what I mean? And the fact that for our period of time in primary school, I got to take my Game Boy outside and all my friends got to play this game together and we all just got to talk about Pokemon. Yeah. And it was fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I 
got to totally nerd out in school and everyone was totally cool with it. Yeah. I mean, how often does that happen? I mean, <laughs> God, not enough. And yeah, certainly not in the, the horrors of school at times. But I, I have to agree. Like, I remember that. So for, for me, it was uh, Pokemon. It was blue that I had on the Game Boy Color. And at that moment, it's one of the first games I remember people beyond us and beyond like family members yeah. being it was the, the first games, one that really know? took over yeah. i mean i'm sure that although we weren't like this and i'm sure that a lot of other people a lot of the boys i suppose mm. would have probably have been exposed to gaming in some other capacity although maybe not, wouldn't have owned consoles in the way that we yeah. did everybody owned the game boy because they were cheap mm. one and that basically functioned as a pokemon machine yeah back then you know i mean it literally the game boy i had that was the only game i ever owned for it and ever played there on you it. Go. but it, i can i just say that might sound crazy to people listening i bet that there are scores of kids at our school oh, similar exactly the same undoubtedly way. who may have then got other game boys and stuff as well i, I never did do that but a, a hell of a lot of people would have had i think particularly those game boy colors for just pokemon yeah. particularly in that kind of first big wave but you've picked gold now my pokemon knowledge is left in the 90s quite frankly so t- <laughs> what where where are we there what generation is that so that's the second game so right. that's the second game so this is kanto was the first one johto was the second one and in actual fact you can go back to kanto and Gold Gold as well after you complete it so there's sort of almost two games in one there although the Canto version isn't quite the same as the original Canto version but there's more to Gold there's a lot more to Gold actually than Red and it's probably my favourite to be honest it's the one that I remember playing the most as a kid because I I think that I was maybe a bit too young when I had Red Mm -hmm. you had Yellow as well didn't you I had had Red and Yellow Mm -hmm. because I think someone bought me Yellow not knowing that it was basically the same Same as Red and so I had Red and Yellow and Gold they were the sort of the original three that I had but I had all these like very quickly one after Mm -hmm. the other and then just having Gold as being like the new shiny thing and it was Gold as well which was a big Yellow thing (laughs) and as well the anime was kicking off at this point the fucking movie was coming out it was all it was just taking over the world and that is why I associate Pokemon more with gold than I do with red Mm -hmm. weirdly I've probably played red or fire red more than I've played gold (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. but back then yeah it was it was definitely gold so I mean I remember that Pokemon moment and it felt like it went on for years back then. It did. Well, like, it probably trading did, cards, but, films, anime. Oh, the whole yeah, game that, after game after game after game. The wider yeah. thing, absolutely. But just that intense moment. Obviously, being quite young, time is different at that point as well. So I just remember when Pokemon took over, it was just enormous and felt like it was the one and only thing around. I don't know really if Pokemon is still that for anyone today. I don't know if it's as big with kids. I mean, Sword and Shield just sold an absolute shit ton, so it's yeah, still popular. I mean, I don't know but... if it's like that. I mean, I think that the closest thing that we've had to that recently was probably Pokemon Go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but oh, e- course, even yeah. that was probably more played by the people like me who were really into Red and Blue and are subsequently grown up and are now adult people. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of what kids play now, I don't think... I mean, I'm sure it's probably incredibly, incredibly popular with kids. I'm not saying that, but in the way that it was so culturally dominant for a while, I would say no it's not the same now Mm -hmm. for kids now as it was for us then because it was new as well it was a new thing and it hadn't been going for eight generations or whatever the hell it is now yeah now it's probably things like fortnite or or what will resonate with kids and they'll talk about when they're knocking on the door of 30 years old about how they saw a travis scott concert in fortnite and how that was absolutely wild totally i mean that that's what the kids these days are talking about not pokemon but for us in the playground as kids with an actual piece of hardware that you had to buy a new mm-hmm. to play this weird cartridge that we'd never really yeah. contemplated before <laughs> <laughs> and you had to have a link cable to be able to trade with anyone yeah. and i was one of the only people in our whole school so i had constantly people borrowing it and whatever yeah yeah it was just there was a whole scene that it's went crazy. along with it that, those know? link cables i have such a clear memory of sitting on the doorstep of my friend craig and that was kind of the point i was going to make earlier was that i think up until that point you know you would talk about video games at school and stuff like that but you didn't really have a sense that other people were playing games the way that you were and there was some as I say I can remember so clearly sitting and connecting up that link cable and making those transfers now 20 years later I can still remember the feeling of doing that oh yeah and it just it was one of those games and I bet Fortnite is similar for kids these days as well in a certain sense but it was one of those games that just made you immediately go I'm connected I can talk to anyone around me about this and they will know it 
and they will have things to say about it and more importantly they will have pokemon to trade me yeah <laughs> which yeah. uh which you won't be able to do on the desert island i'm afraid to say we maybe we have to come up with i'm some okay sort of... with that i was never really big into trading yeah anyway. <laughs> it wasn't really my game like i know that there were people in my school who actually that completed the, the pokedex thing, yeah, yeah. and that was a big thing and i'd never done that and i've actually got a good friend now who has completed the pokedex in every single pokemon game she has ever owned wow and i think that she has owned both sides of all the generations <laughs> and has completed the pokedex and all them which is incredible but i have never completed the pokedex no. and i have no intention of completing the pokedex because that's not really what the games were about for me it was like about finding pokemon that i liked that were new building a team with those yep. pokemon and then completing the game and then more often than not when i completed the game when i beat the elite four or whatever or when i beat red and gold i just started again like i literally just went okay that's that done New save. Like, <laughs> honestly, and then I would just do it again would you and again really and again your team and again. Even, or would you just, yeah, yeah. So yeah. sometimes I would. I mean, I always usually went with the fire starter, mm-hmm. usually. But I mean, I definitely played it with all of them. Like, yeah. definitely played it with all of them. But I just went through the games like over and over and over and over <laughs> and over again back then. Yeah, it was crazy. It was great. I have a lot of lot of love for Pokemon, which again, a lot of people these days kind of like talk down to it and it's stupid and it's for kids. But <laughs> like genuinely for me, it was like a really, really genuinely important game in uh, my gaming history. I know? mean, for you, if connected that, up to Final Fantasy 7 even that tells yeah, you everything I, you know? there's a through line to your modern gaming tastes that yeah I mean I it. don't think that I would have got into Final Fantasy 7 in the way that I did because I initially connected it to Pokemon when I started using that battle system and I was of like course, oh okay yeah. this is like advanced Pokemon basically and um, without capturing monsters you know what I mean but in terms of the actual battle system and how it worked and there was menus and there was items and I was like okay yeah okay this is all making sense to me because I would played so much Pokemon and I don't think I would have got into Final Fantasy 7 in the way that I did hadn't I been so into Pokemon before for that and then subsequently from there i don't think i would have been in a jrpgs as much as i am mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah there's definitely a through line amazing I, I even think that those games don't even date very much so it's the kind of thing that you could literally take oh, pokemon definitely doesn't final fantasy 7 has oh, so badly yeah, but, def- but definitely has. pokemon doesn't yeah <laughs> so that's your fifth game tell us what you're going to take for your sixth game this is where things get tricky <laughs> this is where things get tricky I am going to say Hollow Knight, which is a substantially more modern game than we've talked about so far. far, (laughs) But through that game, and I hadn't played a lot of Metroidvanias before then, I've discovered that I really fucking love Metroidvanias. (laughs) And it's not just that. I think that that game really took indie games in my mind to a whole new level because it is so beautiful in the way that it's made, in the way that it looks, in the way that it's scored. Its mechanics are simple but incredibly precise. It's the epitome of easy to learn and hard to master. It also has an incredible narrative, assuming that you want to engage with it throughout the story that is just fascinating you can read a thousand different ways because again it is my favorite type of storytelling which is like show don't tell storytelling and don't bombard you with a lot of information just intimate what's happening and let you figure it out it doesn't treat you like an idiot it doesn't handhold you through anything at all Mm. it's very challenging in a very good way 90 percent of the time it's like challenging in a way that is really very very rewarding when you get it right it's not anywhere near as punishing as something like dark souls or bloodborne or, or anything like that it's nonetheless so rewarding when you fucking nail something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you go into a boss fight and you're actually confident and you think, you know what, I could have this first time. And things like that, and that type of game, we're sort of missing from a lot of my gaming life, to be mm. honest with you. Like, I, I didn't play overly challenging games. I'd n- I've never really played overly challenging games. I s- still don't particularly have a lot of interest in playing overly challenging games because, again, the like narrative is so important. So that was, in reality, and it's terrifying that it wasn't really that long ago, but it was one of the first games that I played that, that I was like, oh, I'm going to have to like legit practice at getting good at this that wasn't a online game you yeah, know I mean? there, yeah there yeah. wasn't just people in the world that were better than me it was like oh no this game was built to be difficult and you need to fucking practice it and get good before <laughs> before you continue yeah right? before it gets harder you said that it's not as punishing as a souls game obviously famously punishing can you elaborate on that a bit is it is it a game that people will enjoy playing and i say this as someone yes so, on this week that this podcast is being broadcast but that we are actually away this is what i'm playing this is a, oh, really? A flash forward i am because we have this bit and i have to play hollow knight and don't get me wrong i'm super excited to i know i'm well i really hope i'm going to enjoy it but that I, i've committed to playing it or starting to properly play it, at least in this week that i've got away i'm going to take the switch i'm going to do it so am i going to enjoy it flashing yeah, forward? You, you i think well very specifically i know you very yeah, well obviously yeah. yes you specifically will enjoy this game <laughs> if you don't enjoy this game i will be fucking stunned <laughs> 
I'm not quite sure what it is about it. It's dark, but also it like incre- it, it sounds almost like like mushy to say, but it's also like very kind and sort of beautiful game at the same time, despite being a bunch of bugs underground. Do you know what I mean? And there's there's a lot of beauty in the darkness mm-hmm. of it all. I don't know, like I rarely find myself being affected by games in the way that I was affected by that. And to not know necessarily what your path is or what the character's path is or what the protagonist's path is as you take that path with them is interesting because the protagonist is silent. But unlike things like, I don't know, Crash Bandicoot that has a silent protagonist, like you're not wondering about his motivations. Like mm-hmm. you don't wonder why he's here or what he's doing. Whereas you think that about the night a lot of the time and you're almost your own unreliable narrator. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was a really, really fascinating game. And I, I struggle to put my finger on exactly why I connected with it so much. Maybe I need some more self reflection reflection on that but i i did that i did in a big way and it's a game that i would love to go back and play again and that's not true of a lot of games yeah like i am very much a one and done quite a lot of the time with games even games that i fucking love but hollow knight is very much one that i would like to go back and play again and again and again and that is why it would be good on a desert yeah, yeah perfect for that and it, i mean it does have by your accounts of it to me at least in the past it has a lot of legs like there's a lot in the game if you want it as I said to you you can probably beat the game in 30 hours relatively comfortably I Mm. would say but I spent over 9 hours in the game and I didn't feel as if a fucking second of that was wasted like I (laughs) well Trial of the Fool which is something that you don't have to encounter in your playthrough yeah. but that is one of the most difficult things I've had to do in a video game <laughs> yes. I just I think you're saying there you can't quite put your finger on it and I suspect it's a, a bunch of things that have made it so important to you which is one that it has a story that is meaningful and interesting which is a big part of what you like yeah, about yeah. games yeah, I mean. but that it does invest challenge into it in a way that's not overwhelming like Bloodborne or the Souls games are but that is more engaging than it just being another platformer essentially or quite an easy Metroidvania that you know you you're just making your way around the map but it's not a big challenge it feels like it's almost like a perfect connection of certain things about you and about your preference yeah in maybe, that maybe. I, I think is because again something that i want to go and play very very soon hopefully mm-hmm. is go back and play bloodborne because i want to be good at those games yeah. i want to play those games correctly i love to listen to people talk about those games yeah. <laughs> i love to listen to people talk about dark souls and bloodborne and they know all the names of the bosses and they know how to fight them all and they know what ones are their favorites yeah. and i love all that i fucking love it and i cannot play them <laughs> and i'm determined to beat at least one of from software's games in my life and i'm determined for it to be bloodborne yeah you're gonna start there and i think yeah it makes total sense to to finally give one a proper go actually interestingly i considered putting bloodborne on this list one because it would be a new game for me to mm-hmm, play mm-hmm. and two because i thought i'll probably play that again and again and again yeah because it is kind of like 3d hollow knight yeah or maybe it's like 2d bloodborne who knows? <laughs> but you, you get the idea yeah absolutely i think a, a very strong and to me not a massively surprising pick for your sixth game although you did seem to hesitate a little bit when you started it which was interesting but mark your seventh game it's getting more and more tricky as we're going on this is legitimately difficult decisions now that we're making i think and maybe some of these would change if i had more time to think about it but <laughs> i did try and put some like proper time towards this as well like I'd, i'm not making these decisions off the cuff not at all it doesn't feel like it I've got to say. i think it has to be shadow of the colossus and I think I would go for the remake of that, interesting. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Because the remake was just... As, as I said in our last podcast, which we just recorded before this, but you will have heard a week ago, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that the Tony Hawk remake seems to have hit like that perfect intersection of feeling like an updated version of what you remember. It's not necessarily the game specifically, but it's what you remember the game being. It is the heart and soul of the game just brought up to a modern standard of what we expect from video games. And that is 100% what the Shadow of the Colossus remake was. And it had nicely mapped controls as well, which was a huge thing for that game because the originals was a disaster but i think i would go for the remake which is quite interesting i think that in itself is interesting and a sort of decision that i have made in a snap judgment because <laughs> i hadn't really considered that before but i do think that i would probably take the remake of that game and again this would be there with 
Final Fantasy VII, and that it was probably one of the first Japanese games of that type that I'd ever played. A very Japanese style story and art style, very narrative heavy. Again, excluding sort of Metal Gear from this, because I know that obviously that was narrative driven and story and very, very important in games, but it was a very Western story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Whereas this wasn't. This was like very, very Japanese story, although definitely inspired by Western stuff, but nonetheless, it wasn't trying to be anything Western. It was, it was a Japanese game. Yeah. Out and out, yeah, yeah. 100%. Percent. And that sort of introduced me to a lot of other things that I now enjoy, like, w- w- including like anime and whatever. Like my, I genuinely believe that my enjoyment of anime comes from liking video games. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, like one hundred percent. There's a direct line there in mm. my head, anyway. And this definitely was one of those games. And not just that, when I first played it as well, it was one of the first games that I really remember like being taken aback by. Mm-hmm. And the Colossus on the game were at the time just unfathomable. It was like, how is this creature? in front of me and how can I possibly take that down (laughs) it was unthinkable at the time though and you'd never really seen anything like that before and as well the fact that you were the bad guy to a certain extent like you never ever ever felt good about taking down the Colossus and you took down the Colossus and then it went silent and you heard like the sword go and it ate its head and then the dark matter like spews from the wind completely silent after being like actiony music as you try and climb up towards its weak point and then it plays incredibly sad music as you watch this enormous beautiful creature crumble to the ground and you're just thinking well fuck it up I just killed a huge monster I'm not entirely sure why uh, my demon man has told me this might be good yeah and spoiler alert for a game that is incredibly old it's not that great i remember me it being again quite affecting like i think about these games in terms like that i suppose is like i really remember a lot about like i remember all that like, oh, yeah. all that yeah, yeah, just yeah. is completely off the top of my head like i remember every single beat of that mm-hmm. because every single time you do it you went from like excitement and frenetic energy and trying to jump and trying to cling on to these enormous monsters as they tried to shake you off to clinging and climbing your way up to these weak points on its body and then you drove that sword in and then you felt like shit okay, that's it i mean that that transition particularly in the really difficult ones and the ones that would fight you back in quite a profound way the sense of relief that immediately drains back to that oh fuck what have i done that feeling i don't think we've encountered in gaming before i don't i had i never encountered that. that in gaming before i'm not sure <laughs> there were other games that were doing that at the time i have not felt that in a lot of games ever like i can think of very few other instances where there's that particular thing of i cannot believe what i have done mm. in game Whereas that made you do it over and over and over again. And yeah, it was it was just quite an interesting game to have played. And again, like I genuinely believe got me thinking that I think Metal Gear was probably the start of this, but it got me thinking about games differently it mm-hmm. got me thinking about games aren't just well at the time like crash bandicoot or whatever or like whether or not we were playing like Tekken or like it wasn't just that like oh games can be special games can yeah. like tell stories games can make you feel something incredible purely by the fact that they are interactive and you are an active participant in what is going on you know absolutely i mean that game for me yeah still feels revelatory in all sorts of ways i mean we we could do a whole episode on this game alone because things like the idea of just having a game that is just 16 boss battles and nothing literally nothing else nothing Not as else well, in between that that know. is the first game that i experienced that was basically just a boss rush yeah effectively yeah but even that I, I'm not sure that that's doing it a disservice because it's, it's not that. Yeah, it's it's oversimplifying it. And when yeah. I say there's nothing else there, that makes it sound like, oh, there's nothing else there. Well, shouldn't there be? Everything about it felt so consciously decided that this is the game we're going to make. This is the story we're going to tell. We're going to do it in these ways. We're going to absolutely eschew what you might expect of a big open world game, which this effectively kind of could have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was certainly in the time in gaming where open worlds were being explored in a big way. Yeah, you know starting I mean? to... I mean, I think when this released, I might be wrong, but I think Grand Theft Auto 3 had already come out. And, I think Grand Theft Auto yeah. 3 probably had already come out by that time, but it was in that region, yeah. we will say. And so yeah. you're at this moment where like, the idea of getting a 3D world and stuffing it full of stuff was the kind of dominant idea or was becoming the dominant and would continue to absolutely be the dominant yeah. idea for a long time and Shadow of the Colossus just went no, no. we're going to do this right. thing and, and it is amazing it makes it so impactful when you do eventually see a Colossus as mm-hmm. well see just the absence of everything else and you have to sort of hunt for the Colossus and there's always a sort of puzzly section about yeah. how you actually better traversal kind of stuff yeah, yeah yeah exactly and just having you and your horse run up to an absolutely gigantic monster from your perspective is something that 
I'm not sure you can recapture now no. because it's so common. But in that instance, the way that it was done in that game at that time was just so incredible. It really was. Last one then. Yeah, so this is your final selection. What is your eighth game to take to the Desert Island, Mark? It's Breath of the Wild, Lewis. Breath of the Wild, God. I genuinely was not expecting you to say that. I thought we probably missed the boat on that one. No, it's Breath of the Wild. I actually saved this for last because I think, Lewis, and this is me thinking a little bit meta about this game, and this is a game that I love as well, so we're not thinking about it too meta, but if I'm stuck on a desert island and you're seeing the same thing day in, day out, a bit of exploration is in order, I feel. And no game has given me a sense of freedom like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. <laughs> so that was my thinking there. And as well, the, the game just has all the content in the world. Like mm-hmm. you could play the game for 200 hours and I don't think you would be yeah. all that bored with it. Absolutely. So I think that Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is probably the perfect desert island game. Amazing. I mean, it literally even has a desert island within it that you can you replicate go. the experience within it. Has yeah. everything within it, Lewis. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think you're totally right about that. Like, the amount of content that that game gives you and the sense of freedom and the, and sense the quality. Of, of, and the quality and the sense of fun within it. And I mean that not just, like, this game is fun, but, like, actually that you're playing it going, how will I create fun for myself today? Like, I am capable of doing so much within the systems of this game. Yeah. I was remembering just the other day things like climbing waterfalls by creating ice blocks on them. Yeah. And just being like, yeah. just like that was a small part yeah. of that game. Just like great dumb shit <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, yeah and there's just a whole bunch of things like that that you can do in the game and i actually think that i didn't really explore a lot of those mechanics as far as i should have done on my first playthrough and it's actually something that i thought about going back and playing again but it's like obviously it's a yeah. huge time commitment to yeah. go and play it again but i will play breath of the wild again in my lifetime like there's there's no doubt about that in my mind it was such an incredible incredible game in a lot of ways, was the reason I fell in love with the Switch, really. Yeah, oh honest. yeah. I mean, it's the reason I bought a Switch. Well, there yeah, you go. Yeah. To be honest with you, it was probably one of the reasons I bought a Switch as well, because it was that and Mario right. Odyssey that came out sort of at the same time. And the world was going nuts for both of them. And while I definitely enjoyed Odyssey, like for me, Breath of the Wild was a different class entirely and that it is now easily one of my favourite games ever. That game was like, I, I don't mean this as a pun, but it was like a total breath of fresh air. Like it really, <laughs> really was. And the title of the game is like almost so perfect because it, it does feel wild. It just feels like you can do whatever you want. You can do anything. And the game is made to work that way as well. It's made to make you feel that way. And it just pulls it off every time, like yeah. every single time. So it's like m- making ice blocks from a waterfall. Like a lot of games wouldn't let you do that because the water's moving. But in the logic of Breath of the Wild, that would work. So yeah. why wouldn't it work? Exactly. So it does work. Yeah. It's just things like that. You just do things like that sometimes thinking, oh, well, if I do this, surely this won't work and it does yeah. <laughs> it just does every single time because the rules of the world are so clear mm-hmm. and everything obeys those rules yeah. i've never really come across a world that is like so strict about its rules like it will break it all the time for like video gaming reasons yeah. but this just doesn't it just, it just continues to be breath of the wild all the time Absolutely, like whether you're trying yeah. to make an ice block and a puddle or whether you're trying to make an ice block on the side of a raging waterfall it will still do it it'll do it because yeah. It's water, yeah. so why wouldn't it? And it should, yeah, the, the device by which you're doing it would still work the same way. And the, the ingenious thing about the design of that game as well is that they use the shrines, the traditional Zelda dungeons, to just yeah. teach you and let you experiment with those yeah. mechanics so that when you're back out in the overworld, this enormous, incredible Hyrule to explore, you'll fucking do those things. You'll just try stuff and you'll be like, as you just said, oh, I'll give this a go, see if that works. And then it does, and it does something crazy and interesting, and half the time it's actually the solution to whatever challenge you're facing it's just ingenious yeah. design. The way that that game teaches you how to play that game mm-hmm. is really a masterclass yeah, in game design. Absolutely. Like, it, it really is. From when you leave the wee chamber that you wake up in, or the, is that a shrine that you wake up in? Uh, basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. From that point on where you meet the king, from there, the way that it teaches you how to play that game is absolutely fascinating. It is a, it is a true masterclass in game absolutely. design. Like it, it really is. And hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of hours of fun can be had in that world quite easily. And... I don't know why anyone would take anything else on. Like the rest of those games, you can just leave them. I'll just take Breath of the Wild and probably be quite happy. (laughs) Amazing. Well, yeah, I think a very worthy pick for your final game for taking to the desert island and um, there's a couple of extra questions that we would ask so normally for for the real desert island discs you would be given a copy of the collected works of shakespeare and a copy of the bible and you would be offered a third luxury item 
And I was rattling about trying to think what that might be in a gaming context. And I think the most straightforward question would be, you've got this fantasy console. What one peripheral are you taking? I'm predominantly imagining it. it's going to be a controller, but you might surprise yeah. me. Unless I'm planning on playing these games with my mind, I'm supposing <laughs> we would need a controller of some capacity. Now, this might be quite interesting because... I would have said the PlayStation 4 controller, and I probably am going to say the PlayStation 4 controller just before we get to into the weeds, <laughs> but the controller that I have got with my Xbox One X is tremendous. Right. It is good. very, very good. Like I like it a lot. I think I would still probably go with the PlayStation 1 just because I am significantly more used to those controllers more than anything, and I prefer symmetrical analog sticks rather than the offset ones on the xbox controller but i do very much enjoy that controller and i think that that could easily overtake playstation <laughs> as my favorite controller very soon because it does feel fantastic in the hand and this is something that i've kind of known about xbox for a while without really having yeah. experienced but yeah their controller game is on point yeah absolutely they, but yeah i'm going to say the playstation 4 <laughs> controller very diplomatic answer at thanks time of controllers. <laughs> but what it genuinely is really really good so two final questions one that i'm just going to drop in quickly because you've sort of already referenced it but if you were allowed to take a ninth game that is a game that you haven't played would that be bloodborne is that the one that you would go for wow either bloodborne or persona 5 but i am committing to bloodborne you're gonna go for it i'm committing to bloodborne yeah very good very good and the final question mark so because obviously everything goes wrong it's 2020 you're never going to make it to the island with all your games <laughs> intact something terrible is going to go go wrong so if you are allowed to keep just one game it's the the game that you run for on the ship before it sinks and you cradle it and you manage to get to the island with it of your eight games which i'll quickly recap for the listener are call of duty modern warfare 2 tekken 3 Burnout 3 Takedown, Final Fantasy 7, Pokemon Gold, Hollow Knight, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I think it has to be Breath of the Wild, man. I think it's got to be. It's got to be. As probably my favourite game of that list, to believe it or not. And also the fact that as a utility for the game that we are playing just now, the Desert Island games, <laughs> it's probably the best suited to being yeah. the Desert Island game. So yeah, I think it would be Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, yeah. Amazing. Well, there you have it. I think a very, very solid choice for the one to keep uh, a phenomenal game. So yeah, I think you're going to have a great time on that island. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not bad, right? I, I, mean, I mean, there's some crackers in there. There's some huge misses, I've got to say. Some stuff I'm well, surprised. Metal Gear being the one that you've referenced I, I the most. I have referenced but, the most yeah. and have not taken because... Yeah. Unlike a lot of these other games, and Metal Gear Solid 1 kind of continues to be my favourite game ever, and any time that I do go back and play it, I'm just like, fucking hell, this is so <laughs> good. But I never really have a strong call to go back and play it, yeah. unlike some of these other games. For whatever reason, I don't really know why that is, but despite it probably being my favourite game ever, I don't really think it is particularly suited to this game. This. Yeah, so, I would go along with that, yeah. Not that, I mean, God of War was also a big contender, God of War 2018 as in. Horizon Zero Dawn was up there, Fallout New Vegas was up there. I was thinking about indie games as well, like Celeste and Cuphead were both there. Crash Team Racing uh, from back in the, back in the day was there. Time Splatters from back in the day yeah, was well. there. Um, I was even thinking about like taking like either Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, or Vice City. Like that was there as well. But now nah, that I, I think that I have justification for dismissing all of them and the ones that I have taken. I think so. Yeah, I think there's some solid solid picks within that and a lot of fun to be had. So. There you go, we'll pack you off. See you later. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed our little interlude episode. We will be back in full steam next week. Don't worry about that. But I've enjoyed doing it. I've got to say, I hope you enjoyed it yeah. as well. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you, you can find Players 2 on all the social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, that would really, 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 really help us out. And thank you so, so much to anyone that's already done that for us. I know I say it all the time, but it really does genuinely mean a lot if you've taken that time to give us five stars. And it helps us out a huge amount. And while you're over there, if you can leave us a review as well, it all just helps us out. And you're an absolute legend to us. I'd like to remind everyone that our play along game for this month is Gone Home. Still not started playing it yet. But maybe I will do on my holiday. We will see when we come back. <laughs> but I'm very much looking forward to getting stuck into that as well. It's been one on the to-play list for definitely. a very, very long period of time. So definitely looking forward to that. And we will see you next week, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>